Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Teresa Ladrigan Welpley, and I serve as the Director of Institutes and Spirituality in the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. The work of the Ignatian Center is to advance Santa Clara University's distinctively Jesuit, Catholic tradition of education by promoting the integration of faith, justice, and the intellectual life on our campus and in the larger community. And one of the ways that we seek to actualize this mission and vision is through our year-long Bannon Institutes. This year's Bannon Institute pursues a particular vision of leadership, what we are calling Ignatian leadership. Drawing on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, our 2014-2015 offerings explore leadership as a vocational practice, a way of proceeding that seeks to realize the end for which we are created. Leadership that works to affect personal and communal transformation. In these fall months, we begin our exploration of Ignatian leadership with a focus on leadership and justice, considering how commitments to solidarity and social justice ground the work of Ignatian leaders and shape the work of Jesuit higher education as a proyecto social, a social force. Last week, we welcomed Cornell West to campus. He challenged us, quote, not to lead by calling ourselves leaders, but to lead by raising questions and loving others in such a way that we keep track of our shared humanity. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Professor Maureen O'Connell to deepen and extend our engagement with this practice of Ignatian leadership. To introduce Professor O'Connell, I'd like to invite forward her dear friend and colleague, Kristen Heyer, of our Religious Studies Department. Please join me in welcoming Kristen. Thanks, Teresa. It is a genuine pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Maureen O'Connell, Maureen O'Connell, a leading scholar, dynamic educator, and as Teresa said, really a dear friend. Professor O'Connell recently returned to her native city of Philadelphia to chair the Department of Religion at LaSalle University, where she's associate professor of Christian ethics. Prior to LaSalle, she taught for eight years in Fordham University's theology department. Professor O'Connell holds a BA in history from St. Joseph's University and a PhD in theological ethics from Boston College. Her first book, Compassion, Loving Our Neighbor in an Age of Globalization, from Orbis Books in 2009, brings together the work of political theologian Johann Baptist Metz with philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who will be here on campus for the Bannon Institutes this spring. Her multiple award-winning second monograph, it's really beautiful and it's for sale outside, <laughs> shameless close friend talking, <laughs> um, called If These Walls Could Talk, Community Muralism and the Beauty of Justice from Liturgical Press, takes up intersections between aesthetics and ethics. Here she explores community murals as theological sites and urban classics and the ways they can help transport us through seeming impasses of social isolation. She's edited two other books, including one on feminist aesthetics, and has authored numerous articles. Most of the articles are purely scholarly, but for the sake of our students with us, I want to highlight one she has written on teaching undergrads that mines the wisdom of John Hughes films and starts with a, a scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> Professor O'Connell has presented research in Catholic worker houses and international conferences alike, speaking in Melbourne, London, Trento, and beyond. She bridges her classroom with the wider world regularly, from community-based learning sites to mural tours, and she recently completed training for the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. An avid runner, I know my own kids are far more impressed by the fact that she completed a triathlon than her CV. <laughs> Professor O'Connell is a generous colleague and mentor to many. 
She serves on the board of the Society for the Arts in Religious and Theological Studies, and she's vice president of the College Theology Society. So a few months ago, the Ignatian Center sent out an email, many of you I'm sure got, um, advertising its fall quarter programming. And I forwarded the screenshot to Maureen so that she could see the advertisement for this afternoon together with Cornell West's talk last Friday night. Um, she sent back a reply saying, no pressure, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> But in all seriousness, uh, beyond her publication's scholarly value, she has consistently challenged our guild to identify and counter white supremacy, and she's pushed many in the academy who prefer traditional deductive categories to imagine anew, whether in the arts, peacemaking, or taking on the smell of the sheep. Her current research project testifies to her own prophetic posture, quote, spiritual but not racist, religion and racism on Catholic college campuses. So we're so grateful to have Professor O'Connell with us today to explore moral imagination and Ignatian leadership with her talk, Encounter, Engage, and Create. Welcome. Thank you so very much for the invitation uh, to be here. I'm very grateful for Teresa Ladrigan Wepley and the folks in the Bannon Institute for extending it to me. And I'm also grateful to my friend and colleague, Kristen Heyer, for that very warm introduction. It's really good to be back uh, with the Ignatian family and to be able to proclaim my Ignatian roots and proclivities proudly something I'm still a little bit reluctant to do in my Christian brother community at LaSalle, given big five basketball rivalries in Philadelphia and whatnot. Um, but I'm going to be selfish this afternoon and situate some of my ideas about the moral imagination and leadership in the context of an urgent challenge, I might even say crisis, facing my own university community right now. One has actually become more urgent since I even received the invitation um, from Teresa to speak with you. And it's one that's leaving me really wondering what neighbor love, particularly in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, as we like to call Philadelphia, uh, demands. And I suspect that some of what I'll share will relate uh, to similar challenges of neighbor love that you might be facing here at Santa Clara. So bear with me as I at least try to situate our conversation this afternoon in a particular uh, context. LaSalle University has been in the Olney neighborhood of Northwest Philadelphia since 1930. The neighborhood has changed significantly at, uh, from that time. So when the Christian Brothers first got out there, it was farmland. Um, it soon became a uh, European immigrant ghetto of opportunity. And then it transitioned into a Jewish enclave and eventually became sort of the final northern stop for a lot of African-American families who were migrating from the rural south to industrial cities in the north like Philadelphia. Despite pressures of white flight, redlining, and a post-industrial economy has put on African-American communities throughout the city of Philadelphia, Alany has really remained a very stable, working-class African-American neighborhood. We have high rates of home ownership, relatively low levels of violent crime, and public schools that somehow manage to escape the ongoing school closures that are really crippling public education in Philadelphia. In 2008, though, things really dramatically changed for Alani. The economic recession combined with the costs of college and the average debt that families incurred sending their students to LaSalle made living off campus a really attractive option. So whereas 10 years ago it would have been really um, uncommon to see students living off campus, the densely populated blocks around campus now on average have 10 or so more students living on a block of, of 40 houses. So it's 10 student homes and a block that might have 40 homes. So in addition to concerns about noise and trash and public urination and parking violations and brawls, probably things that might be a little bit familiar to off-campus communities here at Santa Clara, 
Longtime residents in the blocks immediately around the north side of campus have also reported an uptick in drug activity in the neighborhood. Although not officially correlated by either university officials or the police precinct, members of the LaSalle University's community building team, a group of students, faculty, administrators, neighbors, landlords, of which I am also a member, are trying to perhaps connect the dots between these two realities. Since the beginning of our school year, we have had four incidents of gun violence within a quarter mile of campus, requiring shelter-in-place alerts on at least two occasions. And these incidents have claimed the lives of three people in our neighborhood. Last March, another gun vic gunshot victim, 21 years old, expired on the sidewalk in front of the oldest building on our campus one Thursday afternoon in the middle of classes. It's increasingly hard not to face the reality of violence that so many communities in Philadelphia and other cities like around the country deal with every day when something like that happens literally in front of your iconic building. And also the way in which those of us in gated communities, suburban or university, are implicated in causes and experience the devastation this violence brings. And yet for many reasons, and good reasons, invoking the well-being of the university and therefore of the, neighboring, um, of the neighborhood, the temptation to distance ourselves from this violence, to protect our own first and foremost, is irresistible. Equally as strong is the temptation to simply rely on outreach programs that meet some of the immediate needs of the community or maybe even our students in crisis, but don't consider the root causes of the violence that renders all of us unsafe. So how do we see that our students' presence in the neighborhood, as well as our preferred charity-based mode of operation, reflected in this image, um, the bottom, um, the bottom there is a flyer advertising a health fair that the community building team just had on Saturday. I spent all day Saturday at this health fair right in the neighborhood. But how do we see that this image captures these two forces um, that might really be long-term liabilities for our Ogons neighborhood, in which we are but one member, albeit a large one? So how can we rethink our presence? In the last few weeks, again, long after I accepted the invitation with you, I have been struggling with what leadership in this particular context requires or looks like. And I've, while I've grappled with whether it might be appropriate to share what some might consider my institution's dirty laundry with you in such a public way, the question of what leadership in this situation looks like has preoccupied my heart, my mind, and my spirit in these last few weeks. I've been able to think, feel, and pray about little else since I discerned my way to LaSalle a little over a year ago precisely because I think it is the kind of place with the potential to incarnate Ignacio A. Correa's vision of a university whose purpose for existence exists outside of itself in our corner of Northwest Philadelphia, even if we do so in a LaSallean charism. The time for this incarnation, I feel, is clearly here. But how do we do it? Plus, I also suspect that you all here at Santa Clara wrestle with your own quandaries such as this, instances where the reality of social sin is so palpable, you feel as though you and the good work you are doing is drowning in it. So I'm going to trust that this is a space this afternoon where I can tease out with you some ideas about we, what leadership in this painful and difficult situation might look like. As a Catholic social ethicist formed in the Ignatian tradition since my college days in the early 90s, my immediate inclination is to turn to well-educated solidarity that follows the standard operating procedure that comes to us from Catholic social teaching. Although developed over 120 years ago, this manual instructs us to blend the basic ingredients of the tradition, human rights, solidarity, preferential option for the poor, the common good, into a three-step process that observes the situation, judges where human dignity is being threatened or how the common good might be bolstered, and then acts accordingly. 
But the more I wade into the troubled waters of the problem facing my historically racially segregated and economically stratified community, and the more I learn about how LaSalle contributes to both by simply virtue of what we do in higher education, the less confident I am that this familiar praxis will be effective. Here are my concerns at the moment. While I appreciate the inclination within the Catholic social tradition to first attempt to perceive what's going on, to get a sense of the big picture, or to frame what's happening, perhaps using ideas like human dignity, doesn't our particular location in and, and relationship to the spaces we are observing, in this case as gatekeepers to resources that can make or break a community, turn those frames into blinders, narrowing what we are able to see or how we interpret what we see. More specifically, don't the social meanings and values that have constructed and been assigned, have been constructed for me and assigned to my white, female, heterosexual, able-bodied, Catholic, tenured body, the primary frame through which I perceive and make sense of what's happening around me generate an opacity when it comes to various dynamics at work and what's happening in the neighborhood, particularly in light of the facets of my identity that have historically contributed to the meaning and values assigned to those identities of people with whom I'm trying to work. In other words, how can I observe when I might not be able to observe the distortions in my observations. Moreover, will what Richard Carlson and Joseph Bailey call analytic or process modes of thinking in their book called Slowing Down to the Speed of Life, which is an idea captured in this really neat public art installation I saw in Melbourne last summer, will logical reasoning really help me evaluate what's going on here? Will it help me make sense of the deep and powerful emotions that shape the way everyone involved interprets events of the past, understands the present, thinks about the future? Is there space in the evaluate stage of the traditional praxis to wrestle with powerful emotions that arise in these situations, emotions that foster our tendency to otherize? Emotions like fear, shame, apathy, apathy, cynicism, all sorts of emotion that get in the way of collective action or social connection. And then finally, what if the action plan we, actually, we eventually implement, should we even complete the first two steps, no matter how thoroughly vetted by folks in positions of power in the university or stakeholders in the community, inadvertently reinforce the very conditions that are not doing a whole lot to interrupt the violence. If these strategies that we employ are not fluid and flexible and somehow intangible, because we know that the violence itself is fluid and flexible and creates intangible results. So would we be better off not doing anything alone if the same old, same old is all we are going to expect? So it's with this sense of urgency that I want to contend that effective leadership requires that we at least tweak, if not perhaps overhaul, our standard operating procedure in our rich tradition of Catholic social teaching. And I think moral imagination can do that makeover work for us and leave us with a praxis that might make it possible for folks in my community and neighborhood to wade into some of the deep waters we're going to have to wade into a bit more confidently. So in my time this afternoon, I want to explain a little bit more what I mean about the imagination, pulling uh, in some examples of different scholars who are doing work in this area, and then I want to apply it to this three-step praxis of Catholic social teaching and see what might come out on the other end. And then I'll conclude with a couple ideas of what I think this means for leadership, uh, particularly in Ignatian institutions. And then in the q and I'm going to give you the work of giving me things to take back to my community at LaSalle um, for thinking about this situation. Okay, so what is moral imagination? And what does it have to do with any of this? So a quick, couple quick definitions. Patricia Warhain, a scholar of business ethics at UVA, suggests that imagination is, and I'm gonna quote her, the ability to challenge existing operative mental modes in order to find and potentially use new ways of framing and making decisions. 
John Paul Lederach, a faith-based conflict resolution specialist, echoes her in claiming that imagination, and I'm going to quote him, breaks us out of what appear to be narrow, short-sighted, or structurally determined ends. Artist and philosopher of education, Maxine Green, underscores Lederach's choice of pronouns, noting that imagination is what makes community possible, since in her estimation, and I'll quote her, Imagination offers the space in which to discover what we recognize together and appreciate in common. And finally, scripture scholar Walter Brueggemann adds a prophetic dimension to imagination, insisting that it energizes people to envision different alternatives by awaking a hunger within them for those alternatives. And that imagination critiques culture in his estimation. And it's in an addressing culture that imagination can take on its moral characteristic. So some, interestingly, I think that we could argue that the moral imagination in some ways has the components that are very similar to this three-part praxis of Catholic social teaching I previously mentioned. So for example, imagination helps us to perceive the more in situations, whether we understand the more in terms of webs of relationships, present, past, or future in which we find ourselves, or whether that more is an awareness of the human beings that are present in the systems or the structures or the institutions or the crisis moments that we're attempting to respond to. It's about seeing the more. And political philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who's near and dear to my heart and I'm excited to know is coming here to Santa Clara this, uh, this academic year, says that in seeing human beings as something more, we're less likely to treat them as objects. We're more likely to treat them as subjects. We're less likely to manipulate people to our own ends and see them as ends in and of themselves. So the imagination brings a sense of the more to the way we perceive. When we start to think about the evaluative stage of, can, of, um, of the praxis, Christian ethicist Philip Keane suggests that the moral imagination allows us to have a kind of playful moment of suspension, where we suspend our judgments in order to get a fuller grasp of our reality. And it's about sitting with some of the tensions that might surface as we begin to notice what we see and what we feel about cer certain situations. John Paul Lederer calls this paradoxical curiosity. I think this is a fascinating word or fascinating concept. And he thinks about paradoxical curiosity as a way of thinking that embraces rather than dismisses complexity, a way that appreciates rather than fears ambiguity, a way that refuses to categorize what we see um, in dualistic or binary uh, ways. So it resists the, bi the usual binaries of black or white, or straight or gay, or citizen or alien, or orthodox or heterodox, or student or neighbor, or drug user and drug dealer. Paradoxical, cu paradoxical cu curiosity makes it possible for us to be with, sit in, stay with the gray. And then finally, the, act of the, the very fact that imagination leads to a ways of being in the world connects it to the very last step of the praxis, and that is act. So Lederach simply notes that when it's not confined by what is or what is known, the imagination is the art of creating that which does not exist. So for this reason, the moral imagination is the risk that we take of stepping into the unknown, into a kind of mystery, stepping outside of the various boxes or frames that provide a sense of comfortability, risking creating something where something does not exist. So I think that this are some of the groundwork or the connections we can see between the imagination and the praxis. Let me say a word or two of why I think we need imagination in this praxis and then talk about what it brings. There are any number of reasons why scholars in many disciplines, the humanities, business, the social sciences, suggest that we really need to start doubling down on our efforts to cultivate the capability of the moral imagination among our students, our faculties, our communities, our congregations, our neighborhoods. I'm going to limit some of my comments to just two, but we could return to this if people would like to during the Q&A. I think the first has to do with a somewhat easy target and that's technology. 
although I know that that is a bit of a sacred cow here at Santa Clara, so it might be easier to make this, to lob this criticism from the comfort of the East Coast than it would be from here. But in addition to concerns about its ability to cultivate meaningful connection, which is different from connectivity, technology's impact on the imagination has yet to be determined, although initial reports do not look all that rosy. Consider the work of cognitive scientists on the impact of technology on the increasingly elusive flow thinking, where flow is described as a kind of ecstasy or ability to stand apart from the immediate demands of things that are present or going on around you in order to enter a kind of space where time disappears, where you forget yourself, where you feel yourself being part of something larger than yourself and that you feel a sense of do what you're doing has purpose for its own sake. Flow thinking. Stephen Tepper, Dean of the School of Design and Arts at Arizona State University, argued just two weeks ago in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that the advent of digital technology and media has fostered an eye creativity, think iPad, iPhone, eye creativity, which, and I'm going to quote him, emphasizes personal expression, identity, individual customization, convenience, and choice, what he calls me experiences, that focus on making and expressing something rather than bigger than me experiences, which, in his estimation, pursue positive relationships with others, feeling a sense of purpose, and helping solve a collective problem. Too much I means not enough us. Superior General of the Society of Jesus, Father Nicholas, raises similar concerns about the globalization of superficiality in the inner worlds of our students, noting that digital technology is one facet of our culture that is, and I'm going to quote him, limiting the fullness of our students flourishing as human persons and limiting their responses to a world in need of healing intellectually, morally, and spiritually. Do things get much more superficial than yik yak? Be my question. <laughs> and yet both Tepper and Nicholas recommend creativity built around an empathetic imagination, the ability to see the self as others might or to see the world as others do, rather than an egotistical one, as an important corrective to the potentially dangerous implications of our over-reliance on technology in human relationships. The second acute need for moral imagination is the fact that I think we're increasingly living in a world of fear. Fear of missing out, fear of our climate and demographics changing, fear of terrorism and threats to personal security, fear of growing social inequality and how to make ourselves immune to it, fear of disease and how to protect ourselves from people who have them. Fear is particularly tricky because it is both evolutionary and cultural. In her latest book, In the Need for Love and Justice, Nussbaum notes that fear stems from an evolutionary capacity that only we humans have. And she calls that capacity anthropodenial, as only Nussbaum probably could, which she defines in terms of our refusal to accept our limited animal condition, the unrealistic expectation we have to be complete, to be in control, to be immortal. Anthropodenial. Anthropodenial creates in us tremendous anxiety and reinforces the ways we have learned to deal with this anxiety in our evolutionary history as a species through projected disgust, shame, and hate of anything that reminds us of our own vulnerabilities. So it's our reactions to fear that are easily translated into cultures. And bell hooks suggest that they get easily translated into cultures of dominance. I'm going to quote her. Dominator culture has tried to keep us all afraid, to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity. Moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is the process that brings us closer, that gives a world of shared values and of meaningful community. 
That's from Bell Hooks. In other words, fear is that which keeps us enmeshed in the status quo, fuels the feelings of impasse, which leave us with, the, with a sense that there's really nothing meaningful we can do about Ferguson, about Syria, about homicide rates in Philadelphia, about drug use among college undergraduates, about the drug market in our neighborhood. Nussbaum claims, again, that imagination is the only thing that can help us get out of our own way when it comes to this unavoidable inheritance of our evolutionary process or our cultural tendency to otherize that which is unfamiliar. She notes that imaginative or subtle wit or imagination offers subtle play or a pleasant way to explore a world of human possibilities, a place where we can exercise control without controlling others and also develop empathy, or in her, in her words, a willingness to give up omnipotence. Imagination helps us develop a willingness to give up omnipotence, and that's her basic definition of love. So with those things in mind, let's talk about how imagination um, can change the praxis of Catholic social teaching. So right off the bat, we could talk about imagination as deepening our first step of our praxis from seeing or observing to encountering. All of this stems from the fundamental function of the imagination, if you remember, to see the more. To see more, we need to move from a narrowly objective perspective to an experiential way of perceiving what's going on. Bell Hooks suggests that objectivity can be problematic because it falsely assumes that there is an unbiased or neutral perspective on our reality, and we know that that is not possible. Moreover, objectivity can lead to compartmentalizing when we perceive our reality according to previously constructed frames of understanding, frames that can constrain rather than perhaps sharpen our perception. And also, in some ways, encounter puts our desire to go with what we know or to start from a place of certainty on pause. Since, according to Bell Hooks, encounters with other people, actual people, can make evident to us the limits of what we know, and in so doing, help us move beyond familiar frameworks of understanding to something new. So in other words, imagination invites us to relate to the unfamiliar rather than analyze or categorize it. If objectivity seems to maintain a sense of control, then encounter relinquishes it by opening us up to the unpredictable dimensions of our reality, namely other people and their stories and their memories and their music and their cultures, and most importantly, their bodies, since it's only in and through our bodies that injustices are experienced and justice can be realized. Another distinctive adjustment imagination can make to our praxis is when we think about encounter, we're really thinking about fate, coming face to face with that primal fear of anthropodenial, the one that drives shame and disgust and the desire to distance ourselves from any reminder of our vulnerability. When we face other bodies, when we encounter other bodies with their myriad of both limitations and possibilities, we're given new opportunities to relate differently even to our own embodiment as well as those other bodies. And with the help of encounter, anthropodenial has the possibility of becoming anthropophilia or simply philia which is appropriate for me and my neighbors in the city of brotherly love. And by this I mean a curiosity, an affection, an openness to the condition of what it means to be human and human beings who embody that human condition. In this way, fear becomes hospitality, difference cultivates curiosity, shame becomes inclusion. And finally, precisely because it asks us to maintain an open stance towards the unknown and the unfamiliar, encounters draw our attention to the present moment, since that is all we can really encounter, all we can really enter into. In other words, with encounter, we're invited into a very Ignatian sense to pay attention to what's going on inside of us as well as the world around us. Our interior lives become a landscape we're invited to map. By expanding what we pay attention to, as well as by pulling us toward an intellectual space of not knowing, encounter sparks a critical consciousness so that real why questions can come to the surface. Rather than what's going on here, which is a descriptive question, or what should we do, which is a pragmatic question. 
It's the why questions that are so central to changing cultural conditions rather than merely maintaining the status quo. So I think a great example of this comes to us from our current pope. If there's one word that captures the essence of, of Francis's papacy so far from my point of view, it would be encounter. And I say this not only because of the various examples of encounter he has displayed so far with the sick, with young people, with the incarcerated, with Muslims, but because it's also central to the social ethic he maps out in his first contribution to Catholic social teaching. His repeated use of the term encounter in Evangelii Gaudium suggests that Francis sees embodied connection among people who would otherwise remain distant from each other as the antithesis to an economy of, an, of exclusion and it's an economy of exclusion that he thinks is our most urgent social problem. In order to resist, and I'm going to quote him here, defensive attitudes which today's world imposes on us, the gospel tells us constantly to run the risk of a face-to-face -face encounter with others, with their physical presence which challenges us, with their pain and their pleas, with their joy which infects us in our close and continuous interaction. Such encounters invite us all to dwell near each other, which is the very definition of neighbor, according to critical race theory, theorist George Yancey. So that's a little bit about encounter. Let's look at the second step, to judge or to evaluate. If we're no longer merely observing what's going on around us, then we add, and we add the moral imagination to this step, then we're no longer judging or evaluating ideas or data sets or systems or institutions, but actually engaging people, their stories, their memories, their emotions, their image, their music. Evaluate becomes engaged when we add the moral imagination. And there are a few things that this brings to the praxis of Catholic social teaching. First, engagement it fosters emotion, particularly what Nussbaum calls the public emotions. In her estimation, imagination is what allows us to tap into tragedy. And tragedy makes it possible for us to understand our shared vulnerabilities with all people. And when we can sh accept our shared and vulnerabilities with all people, we can respond to people with compassion, a critical public emotion. She also says that the imagination makes comedy possible. And comedy helps us not take ourselves too seriously. And when we don't take ourselves too seriously, then we don't get caught up in the fear and potential hatred of those who might help us realize that we shouldn't take ourselves and our vulnerabilities too seriously. So comedy, another important public virtue. The most important of these for her right now, in light of her new book on the need for justice, or the need for love and justice, she says that Imagination helps us to, to foster an intense attachment to things that are outside the control of our will. An intense attachment to things outside the control of our will. She calls this love, and you know from last week, Cornell is, calls that justice in public. Second, engagement fosters commitment, a stick with itness, or a connection which is really essential for social change. Bell Hooks notes that communities of change can really only be built around trust, which requires that we get to know each other, the things that we share, the things that make us distinct. I call this kind of connection, particularly when it happens in creative processes, aesthetic solidarity. And by that I mean a firm and persevering commitment to becoming more fully human by risking the vulnerability that comes when you either attempt to self-express or when you allow yourself to be decentered by someone else's expression. When considered in this way, the second step of the praxis of Catholic social teaching might actually be about resistance, since it's more likely to give rise to a vision that is counter-cultural. The why question with engage becomes why not? The what's going on question becomes what if? So an example of this can be found in the New York City legacy of Dean Brackley, who is an influ influential member of the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition in the early 1980s, before he came here to Santa Clara and then before he went on to El Salvador. 
As a testament to his own appreciation for imagination in the heart of any social change movement, he co-authored a graphic handbook for community organizing called People Power, which outlines bottom-up strategies for social change, beginning with knocking on doors and getting to know neighbors' names and building consensus around stories of struggle and triumph. Interestingly, it was a group of female tenants in the Bronx who kick-started the coalition, as it's called, by asking landlords to take seriously the responsibilities they had to their tenants. The legacy of Brackley and the, and, um, the coalition is, is quite massive. In 2013, members of the coalition, with the backing of a broad constituency, including students and faculty at Fordham, successfully negotiated the Kingsbridge Armory Community Agreement, the largest community benefit agreement in the history of New York City. And basically, it was a really great example of people power, people coming together, engaging around an issue, and insisting that an icon in the South Bronx, the Kingsbridge Armory, be developed in a way that benefited the entire community. So they agitated around how the space would be developed. Initial plans were for a box store, retail outlet kind of place with service sector wages. And now it's the, national, it's the Kingsbridge National Ice Center with 52,000 square feet of space reserved for community activity. Galleries, art galleries, performance spaces, meeting spaces, classrooms, recreational areas. It was the, the coalition that made this happen. The second thing that they agitated around was wages. And they demanded a living wage for anybody who would be employed in the armory. Um, and there are now 260 permanent employees, and they will be paid a wage of $10 an hour without benefits or 11.50 with benefits. And when you compare that to the 7.25 um, minimum wage in New York City, that is, it makes a tremendous difference for families in the in the Bronx. So. Brad Hinsey in the theology department at Fordham and a board member of the coalition identified some of the practices that arise out of this kind of engagement that the coalition did. And he calls them attentiveness, discernment, and witness. And he suggests that these are things that the local church could teach the magisterial church, the kind of imagination that the local church brought to um, the South Bronx. Let me say a little bit about the last step, and then we'll turn to leadership and move to questions. Finally, moral imagination transforms the pragmatic last step of Catholic social teaching into a creative last step. Act becomes create. Creativity is a form of critical consciousness, a particular expression of human freedom, and its ability to make meaning and to make something out of nothing. Again, I'm really setting the stage for Martha Nussbaum when she comes to be here with you in the spring. But Nussbaum notes that creativity can cultivate the inner eye and helps us see the cultural blind spots that we were talking about earlier that cloud our vision when we see only people or institutions in one way or through one lens. Also, laments, dangerous memories of suffering, resilient dreams of alternative futures, the resourcefulness of cultural particularities, all of this gets commuted, excuse me, communicated via creativity. Creativity empowers those who express themselves through it and potentially transforms those who experience it. As such, creating opens up meaningful alternatives to despair, cynicism, apathy. It creates, it creates things out of nothing. It makes ways out of no ways. It helps dreams come to pass. And not only that, but creativity is a lot of fun. It's playful. It cultivates flow thinking that doesn't try to seek mastery over something, but rather is willing to be mastered by something. To use Tepper's term, to get involved in things that are bigger than me. It's in creativity that we experience the sublime, which is perhaps the antithesis of that other distinctively human capability, anthropodenial, whose legacy only gets more acute as decades tick along. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this um, idea of create. A little more than eight years ago, eight undergraduate dancers from three professional dance schools in New York City created an outreach group called Juntos with a mission to bridge performance, community outreach, and intercultural exposure. 
In addition to performing for a variety of marginalized communities in New York City, students in a public school, residents in a retirement community, teenage girls in a juvenile detention center, the dancers traveled to the Guatemalan highlands to perform and conduct dance workshops for equally disadvantaged communities in mountain villages. These dancers literally embody the notion of create, since while they educated themselves about the history of social injustice in Guatemala and did a little work around the practice of Catholic social teaching, they didn't travel there with the intention of addressing the visible external manifestations of less than ideal human development conditions. Rather, they sought after the invisible internal obstacles to human development the struggle to make meaning out of one's circumstances, limited experiences of self-transcendence, the frustration that comes when people refuse to communicate with you, the exhausting emotional work of resisting defeatism. Also, these students bypassed completely the cycle of charity since they didn't undertake this immersion experience with the intention of doing a particular work of mercy, building houses or schools or serving food in a shelter. Rather, they went with the specific goal of creating an embodied connection with villagers through dance. And finally, while they didn't intend for their presence to be political, they did create literal and figurative political spaces in public places community centers, theaters, schoolyards, places for dangerous memories of what the good life is to be shared. And in so doing, they transformed these civic spaces into sacred spaces where people tra briefly transcended immediate, immediate circumstances, participated in something greater than themselves, and glimpsed the mystery of what it means to be human or to be created for community. We let go of prejudgments, boundaries, and discomfort to share together, said Joanna Pazmaleski, who founded Juntos, who is here, I think, with us this afternoon. We embraced our inner and true selves. So there we have the praxis. So let's talk a little bit about what this could bring to leadership, and then I'd like to hear what you, what you think of some of these ideas. So what does all of this mean for leadership in general, leaving aside some of the applications that we might have to my situation at LaSalle? If we agree with the assessment of Barbara Enloe and Adrian Papa, both of whom are professors in the business school at Gonzaga, who say that, and I'm going to quote them, poor leadership may in part be described as a lack of imagination, holding too firmly to the world as it is without exploring the world as it might be, then I think we've got a lot at stake here. Fortunately for us, imagination plays a significant role in Ignatian spirituality. This is best captured in Ignatius' spiritual exercises, innovated for the priority he placed on the varied and unpredictable movements of the spirit deep within the complexity of the person that are revealed to the retreatant only when they enter imaginatively into the scenes of the gospel over the four-part movement of his program. In fact, art historian Govan Bailey calls the spiritual exercises an intensely visual book, particularly through the foundational exercise of composition of place, which asks the participants to create for themselves important scenes and then meditatively sketch themselves into that space, paying a close attention to what unfolds in their mind's eye. I want to suggest that this imaginative capacity provides the cornerstone for leadership, since through it we can perhaps follow the central mandate of discipleship Jesus offered his followers at the end of the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable that teaches us who our neighbor is and how we are to love them. Go, Jesus says, and do likewise. As the late theologian of Santa Clara, William Spohn, notes, discipleship isn't about imitation the what would Jesus do approach, which really puts too much work on Jesus anyway. <laughs> Rather, leadership is about discerning what likewise requires of us here and now, meditatively sketching ourselves into the various scenes of injustice all around us. We need imagination not only to enter into the stories of Jesus, but also into the stories of our communities, of our neighborhoods, to figure out the likewise together. And this is both what requires and fosters creativity. Indeed, Francis, he, he agrees with me on this. <laughs> Wherever we make the effort to return to the source and to recover the original freshness, freshness of the gospel, he says in Evangelii Gaudium, 
new avenues arrive, new paths of creativity open up with different forms of expression, more eloquent signs and words with new meaning for today's world. So three things I want to offer quickly about what I'm going to call likewise leadership. It's a bit of an alliteration, but let's just see how this is going to play out. Likewise leadership. So the first thing I want to say about likewise leadership is likewise leadership is wise to the seductive power of like in our contemporary reality. It's not enough to like. Since life, liking is safe, liking is egotistical, liking otherizes. In our Facebook reality, to like in many ways is to be paralyzed by fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection by the social body, fear of struggle, fear of not having it all. To like is to avoid conflict and to sidestep the messy vulnerability that comes with truly loving oneself or one or another person, or the unpredictability of passionate commitment to things or to issues. In other words, leadership requires that we both be suspicious of merely liking something, or even worse, liking everything, and therefore not much at all, and instead it requires risk, that we should entail loving something bigger than ourselves in an all-in way, knowing that this is the only meaningful way of dealing with the anxiety of anthropodenial. Leadership is wise to the like and is about the love. Second, leadership is about creating conditions in which people are less likely to live in a state of anthropodenial. In other words, it's wary of seeking security of groupthink or authority figures or labels or categorizations. Instead, leadership welcomes ambiguity, contradiction, tragedy, and comedy, all of which can help us become more comfortable with our limits, with our vulnerabilities, with our fragility, with our own mortality. When guided by the moral imagination, leaders start from a place of unknowing, of uncertainty, and then look for multiple perspectives, personal stories, face-to-face -face conversations, difficult silences, difficult follow-ups and follow-throughs, all of which help release the white-knuckle grip so many of us have on our lives. Fear of being politically incorrect, fear of being racist, fear of not getting a job, fear of losing a job, fear of neighbors, fear of change, fear that nothing ever changes. In other words, leadership models and fosters the kind of vulnerability that comes with acknowledging mortality, a vulnerability that resists manipulating others precisely because it refuses to deal with others from a place of fear. Third, I think about, um, if we think about moral imagination as a way of being, a way of moving through the world, then we might see leadership as more than individual acts or even associated with particular individuals and think about leadership as a kind of culture, a collective way of being in an ever-expanding group of committed individuals. This shifts our understanding of leadership from justice that is both individual or even justice is understood as collective action, such as changing the minimum wage or performing for children in a pediatric ward or beyond transforming our institutions. Um, and it really makes, it suggests that leadership is about constantly making meaning for our communities in a way that is fluid, that is flexible, and that constantly provides alternatives to the way things are. So it is about a culture. And then finally, given its existence on privileging not knowing, the moral imagination reminds us that leadership is right here and right now. Right now in the sense that college is not about preparing for another kind of future, although that future is important. It's also about learning to be fully present to the now, to the moment. When we celebrate its innate imaginative foundation, Ignatian leadership calls us to creating the culture we want right now with the recognition that this very moment might be the best chance we have for a different future. For Bell Hooks, that's about learning how to live in community right now, right here, in this room, in this institute, in this particular campus. In this way, we don't have to wait for leadership until we get to the border and the ministry that we do with immigrants, or we don't have to wait for the big vote in our department or our faculty senates. We don't have to wait for that community meeting where we hammer out the community agreement with landlords. Leadership is about a force that we create right now, not out there, but right now, and it's at work right here. So I want to leave you with just one, an image that I think is helping me, is going to help me remember 
some of this, um, and it's connected to some work that I've done with community murals, but this is a community mural um, that LaSalle University did with the neighborhood in 2008. And it's only two blocks from the shooting that happened about 10 days ago. Um, and I was just recently there with students on a mural tour, and I think that it's important to um, recognize that the mural process itself captures some of the, the different steps of Catholic social teaching or a Catholic social praxis that's informed by the imagination. And it speaks to the power of creativity because it's there as a sort of lasting testimony to the fact that new things are possible. New things are possible in that particular moment that gave rise to that mural. If you notice, the mural is not graffitied. It's not defaced in any way. It still has some kind of meaning in the neighborhood. And I think I might suggest to folks uh, at LaSalle that maybe we start by just going back and standing down in front of that mural and remember that creative process and perhaps begin our conversation from there. So thank you very much for your good attention and um, I'm curious to know what you, what you think about some of this and maybe how some of it might work here in your own community at Santa Clara. Thank you. Okay, so we have some time for questions. I'm on a different mic. Can you wait for the... Would you tell us just two minutes, what's the story behind that mural? Um, this, that's a great question. Thank you. The story behind the mural. So um, the, the university closed a two-way street that ran through the campus about 10 years ago. Um, or they, they wanted to close it completely, and the neighbor said, well, no, it's really going to cut off a major thoroughfare um, that provides access between two, two different parts of the, of the neighborhood. And a compromise was reached to only have the street go, go one way. But there was a lot of heartache because there wasn't a lot of inclusivity around the decision making with the, with the, the new traffic pattern, and there were a lot of neighbors who were very upset. We have a, an alum who's a muralist, and he agreed to kind to come out and do a little bit of some reconciliation work after that fissure. Um, and so the person who's depicted here, interestingly enough, was the leading and the loudest voice against changing the traffic pattern on the, on the campus. Um, he, was the, he was the block captain um, at the time. So it is a testament to a kind of reconciliatory moment, or a conciliatory moment, I guess, between the university and the community. Other questions? I'm just one, I can't tell if you can hear this. Can you hear I this? Think it's, okay. I think it's on here. I'm just wondering when this violence erupts so close to your campus, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any outreach to the survivors of these victims? Because I have found that the teaching breaks down when it comes to reality. Mm -hmm. There is no understanding of what survivors have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And there's no, uh, a man on this campus, um, an older man, said to me, well, if you read the gospel, you know you have to suffer. Mm -hmm. But my great niece was murdered. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering how much education goes into understanding the victims. OK. Could people hear the question? Was it projecting? I can't tell from up here. You could. OK. Um, that's a really great question. And we don't have, we did uh, the young man who was killed in March uh, a week later, we had a vigil right near the right near the spot where that happened. We invited his family members. Um, we acknowledged he was the 50th homicide in the city of Philadelphia as of the 14th of March of last year. Um, there was an attempt to get collect some some money and offer it and put it in a um, put it in a in a trust fund for this young man's two children. Um, but there was some institutional resistance to that, and that did not happen. And that's so that, in some ways, is part of um, I think the, the the struggle or the desire for a different a, a, a kind of imagination in leadership that would enable us to tap into a sense of of loss and to lead with uh, that kind of. Um, 
compassion that would come out of acknowledgement of tragedy uh, and perhaps we're better. Yes, that's right. Yep. It's and preservation. The the language we often hear institutionally is, well, we need to preserve the interests of the institution, or we have to protect our students, or we need to be. So it and it's it's very yeah it's very complicated. I don't want to suggest that it's not. I think I'm just in, I'm suggesting that this approach um, to thinking about this situation invites us into that complexity, into the messiness of that, into the emotion and the varied emotions that would be there, and to be with those because those provide a way a creative way through but you're right we do tend to back away um, from all of that yes and also very interested to hear from any students who might have a might have a question how important is uh, a symbolic actions in terms of leadership I mean sometimes I think Francis's uh, marriage feast that he had you know took in a whole bunch of people uh, some who have been living together for a long time, sort of undercut uh, all the academics that we've had before. I sometimes think that the symbolic acts are somewhat significant if you're going to lead the way. So again, people could hear the question. Yes. Um, I. The power of symbol is that it's open to multiple and ongoing interpretations. And certainly we could say that language is also open to interpretation and word is open to interpretation. But um, the kind of witnessing, let's say, of the, of the Northwest Bronx Community and Cl Clergy Coalition that Brad Hinsey, theologian, named as witnessing, a kind of prophetic witnessing, is a, is a very symbolic action. And it reverberates in lots of unexpected ways. And it, it also invites others to take up or inspires others for a, a, a similar kind of um, propheticism. So yes, I, I think I think that is true, and I think in some ways we have a we have a pope who's particularly attentive to the power of symbolic action, and I think that comes from an Ignatian sensibility he has. I think it comes from a liberationist sensibility that he has, and I think it also comes from a sort of um, a Hispanic aesthetic sensibility that he has. I, I talked about that earlier today in, in a class. I think he brings uh, a very deep sense of the power of the aesthetic, the power of the image, the power of symbol. And I think he's learned that from popular culture and popular piety um, in, in, uh, in the context of South America. Thank you for that. Um, this is not a very well-formulated question. Is this on? Okay. It is. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to translate this into you know, some conflicts that have taken place on this campus you know, in recent times, and, and just more generally, um, thinking about what propels people to stay in the game when there's so much rage in the encounter. I mean, it, all, it sounds so great. And yet that, those steps, encounter and engage, those are hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, in real life, those are really, really hard. Mm -hmm. I know you know this, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering what, um, you know, what can sort of motivate to not run in the way you describe, mm -hmm. you know, run and point the finger, I guess, um, in the way that is so easy for us to do as humans. Yeah. I mean, it is a great question, and I recognize that I, I know that I'm sort of a, a wide-eyed optimist, to quote the sound of music. Um, but I, I do, I found Martha, I'm really happy for you all that Martha Nussbaum is coming. This new book on love, the need for the necessity of love for justice is a very interesting book. And that idea of fear having evolutionary roots, I think helps us, it helps me be compassionate with myself and my own inclinations. It helps me be compassionate with others to know that, that in some ways the root of the anger, the anger is just a different way of articulating or expressing the fear. Um, and anyway, it, 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 having read that, it helps me, it helps me recognize that there, there are deep, there, there are deep rooted uh, evolutionary causes for some of this, and that also part of it is 
the result of social construction. And that if reactions are socially constructed, they can also be deconstructed and alternatives can be put in their place. Um, and so um, embracing vulnerability is also a way of embracing fluidity, embracing unex the unexpected nature of our human condition or embracing um, flexibility and recognizing that perhaps how things are right now is not how things are always going to be and that perhaps being present to how things are right now is all that we really can do. We were kind of talking about this a little bit at lunch, that that is really all that we can do with all of the emotions. So it could be frustration, it could be rage, it could be um, a real profound sense of cynicism. Like the stuff that's going on at LaSalle predates any of the people that are there and will probably continue to some extent long after any of us who are trying to work on it are not connected to the neighborhood or connected to the institution. Um, but this practice or praxis calls us to be present to the moment and trust that there is something that is happening in the moment. Um, and again, I don't know if that's, if that's too, um, too naive, but I think that's very hard work. I think that's very hard work. To have the follow-up conversation after the really difficult conversation is the harder one to have. Um, to have a kind of stick to itness with folks who you know, um, you don't see eye to eye on, but I'm going to stick with this because there is going to be something that, that, that we do. Um, I'm going to have compassion for the person whom I don't agree with or for whom there is a, a very unexpected and strident reaction because I know that that's coming from some real deep fear that someone has. So can we surface what that might be? Because that's, that's the stuff. Um, yeah, again, ah. yes, I think we have a, we have a, um, we have I Joanna I from Juntos. Answer that a little bit. Yay. Um, I think the answer to your question, um, just because I'm um, part of the foundation of Juntos that Maureen was speaking about, I think a lot of it comes, a lot of um, living in this and being part of this um, is about having faith what you're doing, um, the community that can support you, and inspiring other people around you to then help support you, that inspiration then can also lead to other people creating their own projects and creating beauty around them, whether it's something big or small, um, because there is a lot of hate, there's a lot of rage, there's a lot of anger in this world, and the only thing we read about now is more of it, but it's about having the strength inside of you to understand that what you're doing is good and will bring about something positive for this world. Um, and I think that that can then inspire other people, that will help inspire yourself, and they can also bring about something better for this world. That's great. Juntos, if you want to know more about Juntos, see Joanna in the back. It's a really fascinating, great program. Thank you for that. Maybe right here. Um, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I love this. I, this concept of likewise leadership, and I just wanted to name just a reflection. What I hear woven throughout your reflection is, is also the virtue of humility, like a humility to surrender, knowing and certitude for multiplicity of ideas and perspectives, and a, like a, a willingness to grant being for the other. Like woven throughout all of that is humility, and I think mm -hmm. that is so much of what we see present in Pope Francis and what's so compelling about his leadership mm -hmm. is just the humility with which he interacts with people mm -hmm. and and I, I that so connects with, for me with a likewise leadership to go and do likewise is to then embody that kind mm -hmm. of humility that's mm -hmm. in Jesus I just didn't yeah. hear you name that okay. that virtue or that yes. category and I just yes. I heard it woven throughout everything Great. you shared so thank you for Good. that I just want to go on the record and say that's very Christian brother charism humility <laughs> I know this is being taped I know this is being recorded but that, in some, but that could be a. I mean, in some ways, that is part of the the Lasallian uh, charism is a kind of a kind of understated humility to recognize that there are there are other gifts, other thoughts, other other sources of wisdom, other experiences. But thank you, and I think I think that that yeah, I think that that's good. Thanks. Um, thank you too for really a, a wonderful lecture. And there's something that you said that really kind of like went ding in me and I just I would like you to maybe say a little more about it 
and it's in keeping with everything you said, but your formulation was that, that at times, or maybe perhaps most times, the local church teaches the global church. Which, when you think about it, is, is, is a very hopeful concept, as well as a challenging concept, because it does place responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, as you say, here and now. Um, but, but it challenges a paradigm that we frequently have, is that, no, the global church is the one that teaches everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have any, I found it, it's a very um, consoling thought. And if you have any further thoughts on that, I'd, I'd love to hear some. Great, thank you. Well, the first thought I would say is that that isn't really uniquely my thought. That is Brad Hinsey's thought. Brad Hinsey is an ecclesiologist, um, and I could get you the reference. He's done increasingly his own um, ecclesiology is being shaped by the work he's been doing with the coalition, the Northwest Bronx Clergy and Coalition. Uh, clergy, yeah, Clergy Coalition. So, um, so those are, those are in some ways his ideas. But I think in... Um, kind of coming back to the, the Pope, the other word in this the document, Evangelii Gaudium, that appears a lot is culture. It appears almost 80 times in that document. And he seems to be somebody who has a sensitivity or awareness of the power of culture and the power of culture at the local level. And again, I think this reflects his liberationist sensibilities, his Hispanic sensibilities. Um, and... Um, so there is a there is a witness that can come that can come from the local. I do think, though, that the place where we get tripped up, particularly I think as Catholics, is that we do still we rely on or we fall into the trap of thinking that leadership is something that comes from outside of us or is something that is very top down. And what I'm trying to argue here, in some ways, is for like a leaderless movement, like an Occupy movement. In fact, there there is this whole thing called Occupy Catholic. Um, that started with the Occupy movement in New York um, that was really about sort of trying to cultivate a kind of leaderless movement around cultural change. And so I think it's got to be about the local and it in some ways has to be about a culture of leadership so that we don't turn and rely on particular figures, charismatic figures, historic figures, even though they're important because they, they give us a wisdom and they give us a witness. But we also need to recognize that leadership has to be about creating the kind of culture where people are comfortable with vulnerability so that they will take risk. Because when you're comfortable with your own vulnerability, you're able to step out and step into things that would be fearful. Um, and so I think uh, local uh, ecclesial communities can be can be can feel perhaps empowered by the attention or the confidence that uh, the current pope has in this idea of culture as being transformative or the place that we we make change happen um, so brad hinsey <laughs> okay do we is that we're at time okay So if we think of this, this model from see, judge, act to encounter, engage, create, can you imagine with us for a moment, how would that shape differently um, one's commitment to, say, comprehensive immigration reform? How would you enter into <laughs> this? Yeah, how would, how would that shape our, um, our own um, praxis? Wow, that's, you know, that's a really, that's a good question, and I know that that is an urgent issue and something that you all do a lot of institutional and have a strong institutional commitment around. Um, I think first it would be um, an ability to um, encounter this reality by getting to know by name people who are wrestling with it, who face it, so that it is not, a, it's not just a social problem, but it's a human problem in some ways. So figuring out where you can encounter folks, and then um, engaging it using different, different sources. And I think there's a lot going on in the arts and a lot of different uh, popular art movements that are trying to address this issue. So perhaps look at what's going on in some of these alternative ways of trying to understand the, the challenge of immigration. And then I would say get in touch with Juntos and figure out ways in which 
folks who are doing all sorts of work in Latin American countries around creative self-expression and around the, um, the intangible impacts of deprivation in Latin American countries can be something that can be addressed through creative self-expression. And then also find the artists on your campus and start talking to the artists. I had a great, um, I had a great coffee with Kristen, and I'm going to forget Kristen. Yeah, Kusinovich. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, what a great resource that you have right here for thinking outside of the box on some of the issues that are facing your community. So think at like tap into the creativity you have right here to start to do something different. Yes. Good question. my privilege to close us first by thanking Maureen for all that you've shared with us. I think when I um, opened, I talked about Cornell West charge to us to, um, to, to track our shared humanity. And I think your um, uh, practice and model and presence with us invite us to engage and realize that shared humanity as well. So please join me in thanking Maureen. <laughs> And I have a couple announcements for the good of the group. Um, first, uh, when you came in today, we're instituting a new check-in system for our Bannon Institutes. And so just want to thank you for your patience with that um, and ask as you come if you could arrive a few minutes early to help us um, as we kind of learn our procedures. That would be most helpful for us. So we really are grateful for your presence and patience as we um, um, develop our, our programs. And um, also there is an evaluation at your seat, so um, we really value your feedback as we vision um, into the, the future of the Bannon Institutes and as we continue um, through this year, uh, your feedback and comments um, are taken really seriously and we, um, and we really value them. So if you can take some time to complete that and turn it in on your exit, that would be great. Um, also available for purchase as you exit are Maureen's two books, which I didn't grab as I was coming up here, but, but Kristen um, uh, shared as, yeah, from the beginning, if these walls could talk, community muralism and the beauty of justice and compassion, loving our neighbor in an age of globalization. And uh, finally, our next Bannon Institute event, which will be next Tuesday in this room at four o'clock, is entitled Already But Not Yet, Diversity, Inclusion, and the Call of Justice in Jesuit Catholic Higher Education. And it will feature several faculty members and staff members from our university reflecting on the already and but not yet um, realization of our call. So we hope you can join us for that. And um, as we conclude, please join me again in thanking Maureen O'Connell.